We're at ISTAT 2015 and now talking with Ross Mitchell from Bombardier. Ross, you just did a presentation on the second duopoly of the industry in which you discussed the programs that your company is involved with. Is it possible for us to have a, maybe a summary from your presentation and we have probably some follow-up thoughts we'd like to talk with you about? Yeah, certainly. The presentation covered all three of our programs. We wanted to discuss all of them. Uh, each of them has their, their own um, explicit need in the, in the market. So we talked about the Q400 for the turboprop market. We talked about the CRJ family in the regional aircraft market. And we talked about the C-Series in the, in the narrow body single aisle market. And the message on the Q400 really was that uh, the aircraft offers a, a flexibility and a, a cost effectiveness efficiency that the other ATR cannot op offer. And um, it's, it's really about the fact that we've designed an airplane that can suit customers on a number of different missions. So we have a business class that they can't offer. We have a high density aircraft or an extra capacity aircraft that's at 86 seats. Again, they can't offer that. The aircraft offer, offers significantly lower trip costs than a larger jet, but gives you similar seat costs. So for an airline that has capacities that are in the range of 80 seats, we offer the best solution for them for that 80 seats on a shorter, um, shorter segment than a regional jet might cover. We then went on to talk about the CRJ, and we spent a, a lot of time talking about the family, because going forward in the future, we're going to be the only manufacturer that's really going to have a family. We have the 70-seater, the 90-seater, the 100-seater, and they're all continuing forward, and we're going to continue to build all three of those members of the family uh, moving forward. Embraer is reducing their regional jet family to really one member, the 175E2. Uh, and that, that airplane will serve about 76, 80 seats, and they have nothing bigger than that that's truly a regional jet, because the 190 and the 195, by growing them, are really moving into the, the single aisle market. And they like to say they're not in that market, but in reality, it's, it's the above 100 seat market that they've entered into. And, uh, you know, it raises issues of scope clause. And so the CRJ 900 is perfect for scope clause because the scope clause today is at 86,000 pounds and 76 seats, and the CRJ performs very well there and provides the best economics. And the 700 clearly is also below the scope clause. And as smaller regional jets start to be retired, the 700 will be well positioned as the only 70-seater in the market to take some of that potential business that comes that way. The 1000 is really the interesting player in this market in that it is at 91,000 pounds, so it's slightly above the scope clause, but it's still lighter than a 175E2, which is at, um, at 97,000 pounds and carries fewer passengers. So there's a lot of talk about these aircraft that have been re-engined, modern technology, but their economics will not beat the CRJ-1000. So as scope clauses move, if they move, we are well positioned. The, the 900 has cost leadership today. The 1000 can grab cost leadership should the scope clauses move that far. And customers are very concerned about what scope clauses mean for them. And, and today, our competition is not well positioned unless the scope clauses make a significant move. On the C-Series, we spent a lot of time focused on the, um, on the, on the flight test program at this point. Uh, where we are in terms of uh, the flight test, we showed a video, of course, of the CS300, which uh, people can find on our website. Um, we also talked about the 100 and where we are in the flight testing there. We're 1,100 hours into the flight test on the 100, so the majority of the you know, um, tests that, that would turn up issues have been done. So we've done icing, artificial shapes, we've done uh, flight up to Mach 0.91 to test the flutter characteristics of the airplane, and everything is good. And on the 300, we, we noted that you know, for a first flight, it was the longest first flight for an aircraft that we can find in his history. It was also the first flight conducted at the lowest ambient temperature, as I think you can attest. So, you know, it was a very good first flight, and since it's had the first flight, it's been up two more times. So this wasn't a, a case of first flight, go up, sit on the ground for a month, and then take the second flight. This airplane is ready to go, and it's fully integrated into our test program, which shows how ready we are now to continue the test program forward. And the most important thing I think we said today was that in terms of performance, 
the airplane is delivering exactly on the promises that we said we would deliver on. Customers with their guarantees are going to be very satisfied with the airplane. And in some senses, we're going to do better than what we promised them. And I, I think that's important. You know, we are delivering on our promises. Can you give us an idea of what promises we might expect to see exceeded without well, giving away secrets? Yeah, I think you'll probably see that the airplane will do very well on range, that the airplane will do better than what we say on range. Let's go back to a second to the CRJ. Yep. American recently announced that they have now got to deal with their pilots for the next five years mm. on scope clause. Scope clause mm. obviously is a unique thing to the United States, mm. um, which is the key market for your CRJ. Yep. If American has taken scope clause off the table, mm. meaning that they do not want to make it go higher, mm. that would presuppose that they would be more, more, more um, focused on your airplane as a solution. Yeah, certainly. I mean, they've, they've set their deal with their labor union, so they're, they're sort of at the status quo. And in that regime where the scope clause is 76 seats and, and 86,000 pounds, the CRJ performs very well. It, it, it has the lowest cost amongst those aircraft. The other airlines, Delta will come up for negotiation, I think, next for the scope clause. The other airlines will also have this debate as to whether they want to try and push on the scope clauses. And the question will be, will they get seat relief? Will they get weight relief? There are many factors involved there. I think the important thing to note is uh, our airplanes today, the airplanes we'll be building in the future, are very well positioned regardless of what the scope clause regime is. If you move the scope clause up by two seats, the CRJ nicely adds the two seats in, we have a longer airplane than the 175. Because we have a longer airplane, our seating configuration always has more pitch per passenger than the competition has. And so we can fit more people into the airplane at any seating configuration. That means we have an advantage if the scope clause moves two seats or if the scope clause moves ten seats. And if the weight doesn't move at all, we have a version of each of our airplanes that fits under the scope clause. We have a 1,000 at just under 86,000 pounds that still performs quite nicely and can give you, deliver to you uh, 88 seats in three class or 100 seats in single class. Let's go back to the C-Series for a minute because yep. that's obviously the flagship program and also the one that everybody in this industry is watching with a little bit of angst. Mm -hmm. You're saying that the tests of you've done all the four corner tests? So we've operated the airplane, the 100, in the entire flight envelope. So we've flown it at Mach 0.91, which is the, fat, the high speed we need to take it for the flutter test. We've flown it at 41,000 feet. We've flown it at the slow speeds at stall. So we know the characteristics of the airplane. So in the flight envelope, we've flown the airplane across the entire envelope. And Siesta predicted all these things? Yeah, well, Siesta was mainly meant to um, look at the, the um, reliability of the subsystems. So the investment we made in Siesta has paid off because the subsystems have been very reliable. And, and that was about taking our time, making sure we put a plan together to test the airplane in an orderly fashion. So Siesta was a big investment. And uh, I think to date, if you asked our engineers, they'd say that paid off. So looking forward now, obviously, the general consensus in the industry is that the rest of the flight test program has to go swimmingly mm. for you to meet the rest of the hurdles. Mm. General, generally, people around at the, at, that we are talking at uh, ISAT here are saying 2016 is the first time that actually an airplane will actually get delivered or mm. enter service. Right. And I think the company line is still later on in 2015. Yeah, so what, what we say is we say that aircraft certification will be in 2015. That's, that's the plan. And then the first customer will take the aircraft shortly thereafter. And uh, we recognize that the timeline for the customer to take the airplane, in some senses, depends on, on the customer. But we will be ready with a certified airplane at the end of this year. There was also um, news hitting the wires today about Swiss being the, yeah. the first customer. Any comment on that? I think, uh, you know, we've always said we have a first operator. We continue to say we have a first operator. We don't like to comment on speculation that uh, happens to hit the media. So I'd say we have a first customer. Uh, we're very comfortable with it, and I think that's where we'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you.